Good morning, everybody. Uh, wonderful to be here. Um, I do have to say I want to thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Glad you are all here you know, for this important meeting. Um, it is something that I'm passionate about, passionate about jobs of the future and what do we need to, get, to do to get there for those jobs of the future. Interestingly, I just left what is called an I-team meeting. Leader Kevin McCarthy has what's called the I-team. If you're not familiar with it, please look it up. And it's all about innovation. How do we continue to promote innovation in the private sector, but it's time we modernize government and modernize government agencies and what we're going to be doing. And in that meeting that I just left, um, Jared Kushner is leading an office called the White House Office of American Innovation, and so one of his top staffers, Matt Leary, was there um, and talking to us about the focus they're going to have on modernizing government. So I, I tell you that to say I just came from that meeting, we're working on it, we're focused on it, and I'm excited about it. But before we can do those types of things, what we have to have, which Congressman Issa just talked about, we have to have the workforce. We have to have the people that are ready to do it. We can all talk about it, think about it, dream about it, but unless we have the people, um, it won't happen. And before I came to Congress, I was a senior vice president and general counsel for our state's community college system called Ivy Tech Community College. Um, we served, when I was there, almost 200,000 students. And why? It is because we were in the middle of a recession when I was there. And what this, uh, the types of students that I saw there, they might have been the high school student who went right from high school to community college, but I also saw, and this is the group of, of students and just hearing what Daryl just said, I think we need to be thinking about. They might have been the single parent that didn't finish college that has come back and has come back looking for a career of the future. They might be, they might be the high school students who maybe want to have a career or a skill or get certifications in something where they can use their hands. Um, one of the most interesting students that I met was actually a dentist getting ready to kind of finish his career and he decided what he always wanted to do and he was still great with his hands, he wanted to be a chef. And so we had a culinary program. So here this guy was uh, with his chef uh, coat on, but it said DDS. That's when I stopped him and asked. I said, what? And so he was trying to find what was the next chapter in his career. And so I want to talk a little bit about those middle of their career and what Daryl just said, said with me. He goes, you know, that could be age 60 now. It isn't necessarily... 30-year-olds or 40-year-olds, it can be people of all ages. Um, and I have to tell you, a lot of the students and the reason our community college and community colleges across the country saw such an explosion was because there was such a downturn in manufacturing. Indiana is the top manufacturing state in the country. We have more manufacturing per capita than any other state. And so there were a lot of manufacturing jobs that were lost during that time period. But let me just tell you um, that uh, a lot of those workers did not, at that time, have the skill sets they needed to get back into the highly skilled, the advanced manufacturing workforce. Um, because technology, as you all are part of, is moving so fast and they had worked in the same place maybe for 10, 20, 30 years. And I have to tell you, I visited with and saw those students day in and day out. Students who had gotten laid off from a very good job, manufacturing job which paid more than $20 an hour, helped put their kids through college, helped them save for retirement, help them, they had pensions, and in short, it was a job they had counted on forever. But when they got laid off, suddenly when they went to look for a job in the late 2000s, you had to do everything online. You can't even apply for jobs anymore if you don't have the skills to get online. Now, this is a sector that you all can't even typically think about the fact that people who are older are having to learn these things that many people didn't even know. Many people in their 70s, 80s, or late 60s maybe have little to no technology skills. I sat, I saw a class of displaced workers who when they were put in front of a computer, now granted, this was the mid-2000s, but that's not so terribly long ago, and they were shown a mouse and were told, and the, the gentleman put the mouse up on the screen. 
okay? He didn't even, they didn't even know some of those basics. They didn't know, so you couldn't apply for a job. You couldn't even apply online because you didn't know how to do this. So I, I tell you that because we have got to, and I think you're, the sector of technology is the best one, to talk about lifetime learning. And we have to constantly be pushing lifetime learning. I have to tell you, part of my lifetime learning is when I decided to run for Congress um, in 2012, I learned that was the election, uh, actually, of Twitter. Okay, I read something. 2016 election was about Snapchat. 2012 was about Twitter. 2008 election was about Facebook. So think about that. Candidates running during those periods of time in the presidential, that's where it is, uh, has evolved. So in this last election, 2016, it's like, okay, Snapchat, I'm gonna be there because I'm all about reaching out to young people and letting young people, so my daughter, who's 25, and my young staffers, and yes, they're all young, you know, which is terrific, but they taught me about Snapchat. And to this day, I, uh, I do snap, it's mostly with young people, okay? And whenever I say I snap, young people start laughing nervously, okay? Like, are you kidding? You are on Snapchat? But with high school kids, college kids, and they love it. And I share that with you because we have to continue to promote and educate our educators, um, as well as our guidance counselors to have kids be thinking about um, the types of careers in the future that we can't even imagine. You know, a, a decade ago, we weren't really talking about the shared economies like we're talking about now. There are so many things, and you're going to hear from my co-chair of the Women in High Tech Coalition, Susan Del Bene, I mean, a tech leader in the country and a tech leader in Congress. There are so many things that you all are working on that we have to get our education system to be thinking about. There are careers in the future that we just don't know anything about, and we've got to promote lifetime learning to be sure, have to keep learning. New technologies, new methods have to keep innovating. It's a challenge for us as policymakers. I'll be honest with you. Um, so how can we be most effective when we will never know what is coming at us with technology? We can't truly anticipate what the industry is doing in the next decade and beyond. And let me tell you, in my short time here, and yeah, believe it or not, five years is short, sometimes feels really long, but. Um, the rules that we put in place, um, we need to make sure they're guardrails, not incredibly rigid rules, because I think that we just can't anticipate what the challenges are going to be. And by the time we put a law into place, you all have blown way past it, and you're trying to take your technology and fit it into old laws, old rules, and regulations. So that's a challenge that we have as policymakers. Another challenge we have is how do we continue to encourage our school systems to focus on STEM and STEAM? How do we get them to really encourage students? And I have a particular focus on trying to keep girls in it from a young age on. And how do we keep um, young women to continue with their STEM interests through high school, college, and then into the sector, your sector, that I know all of you very so very much want more women uh, to join your ranks. But I think we can't ignore that mid-career person who maybe has an interest, who's maybe learning about it. We often always talk about the younger people and what we need to do for them, but that mid-career person who maybe has gotten laid off, or the dentist who is ready for a change, or some other professional who's ready for a change. How do we bring them back into um, and create educational systems, workforce development systems that encourage them to go into technology? Um, so we have to continue those policies that allow people to pursue education beyond what we think about traditional college or what we think about traditional education. I think that's hard for us. Um, and we have to be thinking about, and I think your sector certainly should be thinking about what are those sectors that are going to be outdated and how can we take those people's skills and convert them to the type of skills that are important in your industry. Um, so I think uh, growing, learning and growing throughout our careers, it's certainly something that I don't think we talk about enough. Um, I have to tell you, it does take a lot of guts though, and I saw that for those mid-career students, and I saw 50 and 60-year-olds sitting in class with the 18-year-olds. I saw them sitting there learning. 
that takes a lot of courage, quite frankly, to go and to push yourself back into education. We ought to be incentivizing, and you as leaders of companies and advising companies, what are you doing to encourage your employees to go back and learn new skills? Maybe lower level staffers, what are you doing who might be older or who might be more mid-level to encourage them to go back and um, improve their skills. So I think it takes a lot of courage. It's no small amount of sacrifice to go back to school and develop an entirely new uh, skill set. And But I will tell you, those skills and that hard work pay off. Um, these types of people have rebuilt our manufacturing sector in Indiana. Advanced manufacturing is back. It's totally different than the type of work that they left. It involves so much more technology. It involves them, you know, now running robots that weren't there before. It involves them running machines and the type of technology and the discussions they're having with their counterparts internationally. It's a whole different world for these people in manufacturing. Um, so I think that's the power of education. It's the power of lifelong learning. And uh, I just want to thank you for being here and hopefully giving you something new and different to think about. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gary.